Races, right? So uh, lecture three, here we are on Tuesday, and then another lecture next week. Um, I'd like to give just a quick overview. So let me, let me tell you a little bit about what's going to happen today, actually, right? Um, and so uh, we're going to go through B1 systems, right? So we've been talking a fair bit about uh, the B0 field and the sort of preparation of the so-called bulk magnetization. Uh, today we're going to talk about how we get out of the simple condition of just free precession and how we can tip or act on the bulk magnetization and force it to do something that we want it to. And that's kind of a lot of the magic to MR. And so we'll be talking about the B1 system. So kind of the first half of today's lecture, we'll take a break, is kind of the hardware behind the scenes and some of the map of how the B1 system works. And once we sort of get an understanding of that, then we'll cut from the slides and I'll start working from, uh, from the whiteboard again, or the, whatever you want to call it again. Um, so we can work through some mathematics of how it is that the magnetic fields act together, the B0 field in combination with the B1 field, to both polarize and excite or force the spins to do something. Um, so I'll give a little bit of a review of sort of what the last lecture was about, and then we'll sort of get right into it. And so in the last lecture, uh, we were trying to understand the equations for free precession. Uh, free precession is just what happens to the bulk magnetization in the presence of the B0 field. And we were working in a specific coordinate system. Uh, do you guys remember which coordinate system that was? We're going to talk much more about this today. Uh, yeah, so we were working in the laboratory coordinate system. So that's you and me standing next to the scanner and describing what the spin system is doing. And, you know, that's a perspective. The other perspective that we'll get in today is what we call the rotating frame. When we get in with the spin system, we all uh, rotate around at larmer frequency. And in doing so, some of the mathematics, although initially pretty complicated, uh, becomes ultimately much more simple. And, and really, at this point, we sort of work in the rotating frame for the rest of the course. So uh, we'll make that transition today from the lab frame to the rotating frame. Uh, and we won't yet introduce relaxation. So if you've had MR before, you have this idea, this notion that the spin system relaxes. And we're not quite there yet. We'll add relaxation in the, I think it's the next lecture. Uh, so what we did last time was just identify some, of, um, some fundamental uh, principles uh, that talked about sort of the torques uh, acting on magnetic dipoles that expose the B fields and an empirical relationship that tied together the magnetic dipole through the gyromagnetic ratio to the spin angular momentum. And in combination, what that gave rise to was the equation of motion just for what we call a magnetic dipole. That's not really a meaningful thing for us because we never really do experiments with individual dipoles, right? We're usually uh, more interested in what we call the, the bulk magnetization. And so then we just add it up over all of the available spins, some n total number of spins, and you're thinking sort of Avogadro's number of spins, right? And that just gave rise to the expression that's a little bit more uh, kind of concrete, if you will, that describes what we call the equation of motion for the so-called bulk magnetization. And so from that point onwards, we don't really look back and really consider the individual magnetic dipoles. We just assume that there is this descriptor that we call the bulk magnetization. And really, this works for probably 95 plus percent of all MR, uh, only if you start getting into spectroscopy or uh, spin systems that are like three halves and five halves and they start doing unusual quantum things. Um, otherwise, this, this description of bulk magnetization is, is a really good one and it's used again for probably 95% of MR. I guess it depends if you ask but that question to be uh, So then the next thing we, we identified, this is actually a system of equations, right? So this is a system of differential equations and they were in fact coupled. Uh, but we have to start describing some conditions that we care about. And so. The most common condition we care about in this course is that the external B0 field is just some magnitude field B0 oriented along the K direction. And we stuck that into uh, just a slightly different version of that same expression, right? Just expanding this out, recognizing that the B field here was zero in the I direction, zero in the J direction, and had some magnitude associated with it in the so-called K direction. This again still represents a system of differential equations. They were coupled, we worked through this method for sort of decoupling these systems of equations. And what we ultimately ended up with was a, a set of equations that describe uh, the history of the bulk magnetization. Uh, and these are, again, the expressions that describe free precession in the laboratory frame without relaxation. Um, and so what you see in these expressions, you basically see that the mx component is oscillating as a function of something like the cosine of sine. The my component is also oscillating like a sine and a cosine. And taken together, that represents the rotation of the bulk magnetization, specifically about the mz or the k axis. And we can see that the mz component of our magnetization, under these kind of simple conditions, 
is unchanging. It has some initial condition, and it's just going to stay there. Now, it only does that in the concept of like maybe really, really short time scales, nanoseconds, <coughs> microseconds, or something like that. Um, or if you have no relaxation, right? So these aren't, these aren't conditions that we exactly care about, but they are meaningful for us depending on the exact sort of experimental conditions. Uh, so that's sort of the summary for um, uh, where we were at the end of the last lecture. Questions about sort of the steps that we took uh, to get there? We're going to step back into this today because um, this basic equation of motion is still uh, relevant, but what becomes interesting is when we start applying to the B fields, right? Not just the B0 field, that's kind of boring. What happens if we add a B1 field? And to do that, we have to understand what is the B1 field, so that's kind of what the first half of this lecture is. And then we'll jam a B1 field into here, get another system of uh, different, a couple differential equations, and look for solutions. Yeah? Okay. So this lecture, at least the first half here, is really how do we perturb the equilibrium? How do we end up in a state where uh, our NZ magnetization is, is something interesting? What is our NZ magnetization sort of just at equilibrium? What do we, what, 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 there's a term that we use to refer to that. We have a certain level of magnetization when it's just total equilibrium, bucket of water sitting in the scanner. We have the M naught. Magnetization. That's where the bulk, bulk or total available amount of magnetization. It's a proxy for some real number. We just call it the bulk magnetization, the equilibrium value of magnetization. So just m sub zero. You'll see that pop up uh, in the next today. These uh, uh, the coefficients on the very front here, the mx zero, uh, the my zero, and the mz zero. What do those represent? We have a, that, that represents a solution to those differential equations, right? And if we look at, say, time zero, we have an initial condition. And so those, whenever we subscript, and you'll see this a bunch in this class, we uh, subscript the direction or the component that we care about. If we superscript to zero, we're talking about some initial condition. And we're going to talk a lot about different initial conditions. So always think of that as the initial state of the magnetization. So the, the M naught, was that the strength at the point at the center? Um, we have B naught, which is the measure of the magnetic field, and then M, and, and ideally B naught, B zero. Disappear here for a second. So at the middle of the scanner, we had B naught, right? And so, see how great that is. <laughs> just to keep everyone on the same page. So in the middle of the scanner, we had B naught. And we said that it was B naught sort of everywhere. Uh, we can also talk about how much bulk magnetization we have, and we refer to that as M naught. And so this is sort of the maximum amount of magnetization that you can have. And so whatever M vector we have, uh, the most it can have, say, at time equals to zero, is M naught. And the, um, what you should really be thinking about in that case is that this M vector, or the sort of simplest circumstances that we care about, that's component zero, zero, and not. And that's specifically when our B field is equal to some B naught multiplication. And this is going to be true for this entire course. We're not, we're not going to change that B zero condition. That's true of, say, all conventional MR systems. OK, so again, this is all about how do we perturb the magnetization. <clears throat> There's a lot of kind of terms you have to sort of grapple with to begin with. What we talked about last time is free precession in the laboratory frame, right? What is, happens to the bulk magnetization just in the presence of B0? Today, we're going to talk about forced precession in the laboratory frame. And I'm actually going to show you, so that's the laboratory frame is that coordinate system that's anchored to the scanner, right? We're standing next to it looking at it. And there's kind of a problem with that system of equations. They get pretty complicated really quickly, and general solutions aren't really available to us. And so we look for another option. What's that option? Well, the option is to transform from the so-called laboratory frame to the rotating frame. And so what we're going to talk about today is free precession in the rotating frame. What's the description of the spin system if we are all rotating at the Larmor frequency? Um, and then we're going to move from that to talking about force precession in the rotating frame. So what happens when we're, when we're rotating with the spins, but now the B1 field is acting on those spins as well? Um, and again, that's all in a coordinate system that's anchored to the spin system. And then later, we'll introduce this concept of relaxation. So 
I alluded to this before, we can ignore relaxation under certain conditions. You could do it when the relaxation time constants are really, really, really long. So if the time scale of the events you care about is milliseconds or microseconds, but your time constants are tens or hundreds of thousands of seconds, then that's maybe a reasonable thing. Uh, or if the time scale of the event is really, really short relative to the time constant itself. So uh, kind of same, you know, the same thing. Okay, so this is where we are in our flow diagram, sort of how, the, how things are progressing through uh, from you know, the magnetic dipoles ultimately to images. And what we're really talking about today is how the B1 field can be used to transform the bulk magnetization into so-called transverse magnetization. Um, if you've taken MR before or picked up on this in kind of the first couple lectures, why do we care about transverse magnetization? Why is that, why do we want transverse magnetization? What's that? Um, signal, detection. signal detection, right? So the MR systems, the way they're designed, built, and tuned is that they're sensitive to detecting the state of the transverse magnetization. That won't become obvious until uh, kind of lecture 8 or 9 or 10 or something like that. But the bottom line is we have to generate transverse magnetization because that's what our coils are sensitive to detecting. Uh, there's a bunch of reasons for that, but it, it'll, we'll have to do a deeper dive with what uh, becomes maybe obvious. Okay, so we got to get underway here with the V1 system. Uh, again, learning objectives, just pointing out the things that I think are important if you go back and look at this material. Uh, when we talked about the B0 field and when we will talk about the gradient fields, there's a, a slide that's similar to this, uh, which basically just gives this overview of what is the B1 field. So the B1 field is radio frequency, so we oftentimes call this a radio frequency pulse. Uh, what makes it radio frequency? Well, it's electromagnetic radiation in the megahertz range, and so that's typically the, uh, the radio frequency range. And the uh, uh, frequencies that we care about are related to the, uh, the B0 field and the gyromagnetic ratio, right? They give rise to some warmer uh, frequency. And at one and a half Tesla, that's 63 megahertz. Um, we typically use B1 fields in very short intervals or short durations. So an RF pulse might be a couple hundred microseconds. It might be maybe a few or even tens of milliseconds. Uh, but we think of those as pulses. And so where B1 fields are oftentimes referred to as just RF pulses. Uh, they're obviously time varying, right? These are very high frequency. What about B0? Is B0 high frequency? No, right? Static, right? It's constant, rather. Constant in time. Uh, and this is small amplitude, right? So the B1 field is only about, you know, it's less than 30 microtesla. It might be 4 microtesla or 1 or 10 microtesla. So it's, it's small in amplitude, whereas the B0 field, of course, is tesla, right? So there's six orders of magnitude, five orders of magnitude. Uh, we'll learn about this today, but this electromagnetic field is actually circularly polarized. Uh, and we'll figure out what that means, but it effectively means that that B1 field that we generate is rotating at a particular frequency. Uh, it's rotating uh, at the larger frequency. It is, of course, a magnetic field. It has to, it's interacting with our spin systems because it is a magnetic field. Uh, and in terms of its uh, action or its, um, its components, it's perpendicular to B0. So there's some kind of important distinctions in your time scales, its magnitudes, its directions. This is a very different field from the B0 field, uh, but critical, uh, right, to uh, MR. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about resonance. We talked about this some before, but we can talk about this in the context of the radio frequency pulses that we use. This is one uh, sort of uh, uh, animation that's uh, uh, put together by this guy, Hansen. There's a pretty good paper uh, that's called Is Quantum Mechanics Necessary for Understanding Magnetic Resonance? And his basic tenet is, no, it's not. And we sort of adopt that in this class, but we touch on a couple things, probably the last of which show up in this lecture. Um, and so if you have an ensemble of magnetic dipoles, right, every little blue vector here is a magnetic dipole. We've got millions and billions of these. We learned that in the presence of a B0 field, we'll have this sort of for alignment and against alignment. The reason he shows it as sort of this koosh ball many direction things is kind of nuanced in the paper. What you'll notice, though, is the density is higher at the top than at the bottom. And that gives rise to some bulk uh, magnetization that's pointing along, in this case, the positive z direction. Uh, so there's sort of different descriptions of what's happening in terms of resonance. In quantum physics, we can talk about electromagnetic radiation that's of a particular frequency, omega RF, and that carries energy that, indu that induces what we call a coherent transition. It can force spins to go from that, uh, it should be from the uh, low energy spin up state to the high energy, or it should be the other way around, I think from the low energy spin down state to the high energy spin up state. That's what the RF pulse does, is it forces that transition 
In classical physics, we actually think of this, or the B1 field, as rotating in the same manner as the processing spins. So we have this bulk magnetization that's processing at the Larmor frequency. The B1 field also rotates at the same frequency and thereby can coherently push on the bulk magnetization. So you'll see me with my arm do a lot of waving like this for precession, and then you'll see me talk about force precession as the B1 field is pushing the bulk magnetization down into the transverse plane. Um, we can talk about the amount of energy required to do this, and so we know that there's an energy associated with being in the spin down state and an energy associated with being in the spin up state. We talked about this in the context of Zeeman splitting before. And so the delta energy between those two states is just Planck's constant times gamma times d0. Uh, the energy of an arc pulse is, comes out of Planck's law, which is just Planck's constant times the frequency of irradiation. And so all this is really telling us or showing us is that uh, the resonance condition is such that the frequency of the RF pulse needs to be matched to the frequency of the spins uh, as a consequence of p0. Right? That probably sounds very obvious. This is sort of the physics description of that. The radio frequency energy has to, have, has to be of the same frequency as the spin system if the radio frequency energy is going to act on and force the bulk magnetization to do something. If they're wildly different frequencies, there's no resonance condition. It's just electromagnetic radiation at some other frequency. Um, so resonance requires that the frequency of the RF energy, omega RF, match uh, the frequency of precession of zero. And so then uh, what you end up with, uh, it'll show up I think here, is the effective action of that radio frequency field is to push or force the bulk magnetization to tip over. This is really showing closer to the classical description. It's really hard to kind of bridge exactly between those two. But this is the picture that you should have in mind. So in this case, the bulk magnetization vector, it was processing the whole time, right, as a consequence of the B0 field. But it was the B1 field that caused it to mutate or, or rotate over until uh, in this particular animation, it's a spin system that ends up being tipped over by 180 degrees. We'll refer to that as an inversion pulse. We'll talk more about sort of different kinds of arc pulses later. So here you see, the, you see two things happening. You have precession, precession because of B0 and this inversion or mutation because of B1. So what's the, um, what's the sort of hardware component that actually drives this process behind the scenes? Uh, it gets referred to in different ways. If we do a teardown of the scanner, we spent a fair bit uh, previously talking about the cryostat, which is shown in purple, holds the liquid helium, keeps everything at super, superconducting temperatures. And then the so-called main coil, the B0. B0 supports that 500 amp or 1,000 amps of current if it's a 3T system. Uh, so you get that uh, strong, uniform, persistent B0 field. Uh, we won't go through all the hardware components here. You can see, uh, we'll get to them later, the grading components, which induce field uh, inhomogeneities that are useful for imaging. And then what we really care about today is the so-called body coil, or the uh, sometimes called the TX coil for transmit. It can also be an RX coil, a receive coil. We'll talk about the pluses and minuses of, a, of that later. But what it boils down to is surrounding isocenter. So isocenter is the 00, zero coordinate, the 000, zero zero coordinate of the MR system. Uh, the system is engineered to have the best field, the best V0 homogeneity at isocenter. And the so-called B1 coil or body coil is also geometrically designed to produce the most uniform B1 fields at isocenter as well. So everything is designed around isocenter. We'll get to the gradients. The gradients, no surprise, are also designed to, to have best performance in and around isocenter. So what does this look like? Well, the most common hardware designs are called our bird, uh, bird cage coil. Um, it's highly efficient, meaning that most of the fields that are produced contribute to imaging. You could design a really bad coil that would do nothing more than heat up the, per the person, right? And that's not a good idea, right? And so these systems are designed such that most of the energy, uh, or as much energy as possible, is efficiently going into transitioning the spin system rather than heating up the patient. That being said, patients can still be heated up. Uh, so this particular coil design, we'll talk a little bit more about it in detail, but the, the point is that it's highly efficient. It's also really uniform, especially in the radial direction. So if you look at an axial slice through someone's body, the B1 field will be very uniform in magnitude. As a magnitude in a phase, we'll sort of drill into these things as the course develops. Uh, but it falls off somewhat axially. So if I put my chest at the middle of the scanner and I try to take pictures of my head, I don't do very good with MR uh, because the, the B0 field's not very good way up here because I'm far from isocenter. 
and the B1 field is going to decay axially and not be very good either. So one of the tenets of MR is that the body part of interest, you move to isocenter. If it's a knee scan, you put your knee at isocenter. If it's a head scan, put your head at isocenter. That's where all the best imaging is going to be possible. Uh, that being said, you do get a pretty uniform uh, sphere of excitation for lengths that are approximately equal to their diameter. And so the diameter of this thing has to be big enough to hit fit human subjects, so it's about 70 centimeters in diameter, and so then its length is also about 70 centimeters long. What's interesting about this uh, design, and again, we'll, we'll get into this a little bit, is it helps us generate what we call a quadrature field, or, cir or, or so-called circular polarization. So the B0 field is just pointing in a single direction for all time, right? It's B0 along the K direction, and it hangs out there. You can have a radio frequency field that just, os they're, they're oscillatory, right? It's radio frequency after all. It could just oscillate back and forth along, say, the x direction. And that'll work for excitation. It turns out not to be the most efficient thing in terms of excitation and patient heating. You have minimum patient heating and maximum excitation. And so we use so-called circular polarization. And these are just two images that are poached uh, from Wikipedia uh, that sort of demonstrates this idea of, of circular polarization. And so here we have, on the left-hand side here, a counterclockwise or left-hand circularly polarized field if you look at isocenter here, the direction of the field is changing, right? And it can go through, say, a cycle in a, in a unit of time, and so therefore it has a frequency. The RF bird cage coil is basically going to generate a circularly polarized radio frequency field. The reason for that is the RF energy is sort of chasing the magnetization, right? You know your magnetization is zipping around at 64 megahertz. You want your radio frequency excitation energy to do the same thing. That's the most efficient thing that you can do. We'll show it now. So what does excitation look like in the laboratory frame? This is you and I standing outside of the scanner. This is a bunch of bulk magnetization vectors uh, sort of cut axially, right? So imagine this lovely person lying in the scanner. Uh, this should go. Uh, here, we're going to turn on our B1 coil, and we'll see that the bulk magnetization is both precessing. Uh, oh, sorry. Should be precessing. doesn't go, okay, we'll just go back and I'll describe it. What you should be saying, I don't know why the movie's not linked or not playing, but you have bulk magnetization. These are little um, little balls that are white on one side, red on the other. And you should basically see it wobbling around and then tipping into the transverse plane such that you just see white and red processing. And that's the action of the RF pulse, right, to generate so-called transverse magnetization. There'll be another movie uh, So you saw this slide previously, and this is just to highlight it one more time. There's really three different forms of kind of rotational motion that you need to concern yourself of at the sort of spin and bulk magnetization level. At the, at the, at the uh, magnetic dipole level, you have to uh, remember what spin is, right? Spin is this intrinsic angular momentum. You can't create it, can't destroy it, always there. Uh, we also talk about precession, and precession is this rotation that's due to the B0 field. And then we can similarly talk about mutation, and that's this, this force rotation caused by the B1 field. Now, in principle, we can turn, uh, we can superpose both a B0 field and a B1 field, right? We can play these things at the same time. And so, as a consequence, the spin system will be processing because of B0, but also tipping down because of B1. Um, so, just keep in mind that spin, precession, and mutation uh, point to very different things. You don't want to confuse that terminology, if you will. Um, so how do, what's the uh, sort of hardware design behind how this all sort of comes together? Well, I said it before, we use these bird cage coils. They're used because they generate relatively low SAR. SAR was the watts per energy, or watts per kilogram, right? The energy being deposited in the subject. And you want the lowest amount of energy, although there's going to be some. Uh, and circularly polarized fields actually give us that combination of helping us ex excite spins efficiently and not heat up patients as much. The, the basic idea, I'll, I'll go through these slides kind of in succession. There's five or six slides that kind of just roll through in, your, in the slide deck that you guys have. Uh, obviously, in the absence of any applied RF field, the bulk magnetization is oriented along the Z axis, right? So we have some bulk magnetization vector in the middle, and it's just pointing straight out. 
And what the B1 coil is going to do is run current through one of these rungs at a particular frequency, and with a phase offset, run current through the next rung, the next rung, the next rung, the next rung, the next rung. What that means is in a very short period of time, when there's current, you know, say maximum current running through that particular rung of this birdcage coil, that'll generate a B field that helps push the bulk magnetization, in this case, maybe off-center down this way. The next thing to do is to cycle down that current and cycle up this current. And so now you're going to be pushing more, uh, uh, you're going to be pushing more with a uh, magnetic field generated by this rung. And the, and the process just continues such that we're ultimately uh, rotating that magnetic field by oscillating currents in each of these different rungs such that we can push over our transverse magnetization. How do you do that? Well, you have to put some oscillatory current into that system. There's different ways of electronically designing these things, but at the, at the current level, this is what's happening. And so you have some maximum current and sine oscillating at the carrier frequency that you care about, omega RF, and then it has some phase offset. And the phase offset just depends on the number of rungs that you have, right? So in this case, we've got six rungs, and so you can work out what's the phase offset between each of those. So they have the same driving current magnitude, if you will. They're just phase offset from one another. And that has the effect of sort of chasing uh, the bulk magnetization around at the larmer frequency because the system is designed to, uh, to be tuned to the, the larmer frequency that we can. Uh, okay, so that's the kind of basics for how the hardware uh, sort of comes together. Uh, something that um, we won't talk about too much today, but it'll come back a little bit later, is so-called B1 inhomogeneity, right? Uh, MR scientists don't like to talk about things being heterogeneous, they talk about it being inhomogeneous, fine. What does B1 inhomogeneity mean? It means that the B1 field that you have a design uh, consideration. You want a certain B1 field because, as you'll see kind of later today, the B1 field will control sort of how far we can tip the magnetization, right? We might, for a particular sequence, want to tip exactly by 90 degrees. But there's actually no guarantee that our B1 coil will allow us to tip exactly 90 degrees everywhere. Uh, when the system is imperfect and when the object is inhomogeneous, you'll get an uneven B1 field in your object, despite your best effort. And we call that B1 inhomogeneity. Um, so it's due to hardware imperfections, uh, conductivity and permittivity differences uh, of the subject or the object that you're imaging, and also so-called wavelength effects. So this can become an even bigger problem at, at higher field strengths, 7T and 11T. They have to deal a lot with so-called B1 inhomogeneity. Uh, the, the wavelengths are, are um, uh, a lot longer at one and a half T into the lower fields and you don't get these so-called wavelength effects. So this is just an image suggesting that there's a problem with getting excitation in this particular region here where the white arrow is. You're not, you're not exciting spins. Uh, they've drawn out in this paper, at least, that that's due to a B1 effect. And there are some things that you can do to sort of tune the coil and, and adjust the patient and so forth such that you're now getting better excitation in that particular place. So bottom line, we want uniform B1 fields, but we don't always get uniform B1 fields. Okay, uh, so questions about sort of the, kind of at least the hardware that's behind the B1 excitation? So what we're gonna do, we've got, I don't know, maybe another 20 slides or something like that, kind of up to the break, to talk about sort of heating and some more about polarization and, and uh, some sort of B1 safety. Uh, this came up before, even just a few minutes ago, the so-called specific absorption rate. So that's just a measure of the rate of energy absorption during exposure to this RF field. We measure in terms of watts per kilogram. Um, high field, whereby I mean sort of greater than one and a half Tesla imaging, uh, with high flip angles. We'll learn more about what flip angles are and what high means, but take it for now that high flip angles are, say, more than 45 or 90 degrees. That can be challenging which means if I go to a 7T system, more than one and a half T, and I want to do imaging with a bunch of 90 degree or 180 degree pulses, I'm going to be faced with a SAR limitation. And FDA and the hardware of the system and the software is going to put up a warning and say, sorry, you can't, you can't do that. It's too much energy going into the patient uh, per unit time, too many watts per kilogram. Um, we won't drill down into it too much, but it's just to show here that the SAR is proportional to the larmer frequency squared B1 squared, uh, and B1 is related to the flip angle, so it's also B0 squared and alpha squared. So this points to one of the challenges of higher and higher uh, field imaging, that it goes to B0 squared. So the SAR is doubling when we go from 1.5T to 3T. Uh, 
And this actually for, uh, is a very practical limit, meaning uh, we bump up against star limits pretty routinely. So MR kind of just hovers right at the end, at the edge, if you will, kind of practicality uh, in some sense. Uh, a big table here, no point in, in sort of memorizing all of this or anything. Uh, in the U.S., uh, there, 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 there are IEC European regulations or FDA uh, regulations about how much heating is permissible uh, and where that heating uh, can be positive, right? So if we're doing, uh, if we're imaging someone's chest or we're imaging their abdomen, more heat deposition there is, is or an intermediate level of, of uh, heating there is okay because the body can dissipate it well. Uh, the head, uh, let's see, yeah, so the head average is actually lower. Um, I don't know why it says it shouldn't say head in that column. Here it says the head average has to be less than three watts per kilogram. That's mostly because your eyes, for example, are a very sensitive organ, very thermally sensitive organ. They don't dissipate heat very well. And so we have to be more conscientious of heat deposition in the head than we do in other parts. And then when it comes to, again, I don't know why that says head, but when it comes to the, uh, the trunk uh, or the extremities, uh, heating up your legs, your arms, uh, you can tolerate more heat dose there because they're not as thermally sensitive. So if the other area is uh, 10 watts, 20 watts, 3 watts, but your whole body average is 2 watts, is yeah. that because we have certain areas where it's like absolutely zero tolerance? Uh, no. So uh, I, don't, I don't think it's that. So uh, do the thought experiment with me. If you think about where the B1 coil, we, I said just a second ago, let's say we're going to do head, a head scan, right? So I'm going to put your head in isocenter, and that's also where the B1 coil is. So when I excite and turn on the B1 coil to do imaging, I'll be, I'll be uh, depositing energy, not in the slice that I care about, but in the volume of the B1 coil, right? So we haven't gotten into slice selection. MR is really interesting in that we can sort of excite just a thin slice. The B1 field will sort of be deposited in the volume of the B1 coil, right? What does that mean? That means if I'm scanning your head, your feet are so far away that they're not gonna get any soft. So right? this is local, that's kind of like surface? Uh, like head trunk local and extremely local? Yeah, you know, I, I don't know what the definition is for local, so that's that's, that's a fair point. Um, I think what it's probably referring to is that in, in a, it's, there's another nuance here in that we, we, have a, we can't directly measure these things. We have to estimate them through simulation, right? We don't measure heating. We have to estimate it, what the system is likely to positive need to do. So that's what gives rise in part to these guidelines. I think for local, they just basically mean uh, not your head, so-called body, right? So it could be shoulders, it could be knees, it could be ankles, it could be so if you had some local deposition because of some. Stuff. But you get what I'm asking, right? Whereas Say it again. it's like if you have three numbers that are all higher than two, uh -huh. and that's like the whole body, then it's like you have to have something that's lower than two to average out the two. Um, Uh, no, so that, yeah, no, that's right. And so when they, when the, there's, so there's a computer model on the scan that it's estimating SAR, and it may in fact estimate that your head SAR is say less than eight watts per kilogram, right? And so then according to the head SAR, you're okay, oh, okay. right? So that that's acceptable. Right. The system will simultaneously be estimating what's the whole body SAR, yeah. right? And so if either one of those exceeds thresholds, then it's out. It's good questions. It's, it's actually a, a topic that's of interest to me. We don't spend a lot of time on safety in here, but I try to at least point out the, some of the relevant things here so you don't uh, miss their importance when you're sort of actually working through the clinical subjects or research subjects. Uh, bottom line, we bump up against SAR limits pretty, pretty frequently. And there's different ways to sort of work with that. I mean, if you, go back, if you go back to this slide, you would say, okay, well, one option is to decrease my B1 field. I can't generally change B0, right? B0 is fixed. But I can do things to just B1. Now, adjusting B1 usually means lowering what we call a flip angle, something we'll talk about in just a second. But we do have to manage the SAR. Uh, it's also watts, so it's energy per time. And so one thing you can do, there's actually, behind the scenes, there's more calculations that calculate like a short-term SAR, intermediate, and longer duration of SARs. Uh, and so uh, you, can, you can actually exceed some of these limits for very, very brief periods of time, seconds, as long as you do very, very little subsequent. And that happens in MR a lot as well. You excite, you do something, and then you have to wait before you excite and do something again. For, not for SAR reasons, but maybe for relaxation purposes. Okay, so mathematically, what does the B1 field look like? Well, this is, uh, I alluded to previously, but this is what we would call a linearly polarized field. And so we have B1 as a function of time. It's a vector field. It's a vector quantity. 
the two is not terribly important, but it's mathematically useful there. And what you see here is a so-called envelope function. If you look in the background of this slide, you'll see the sort of sync-like function. That's an example of an envelope function. The envelope function is some kind of low frequency thing that governs you know, how much V1 field we have as a function of time. So we could modulate the V1 field with an envelope function that looks like a sync, the thing you see in the background, or it could be a rect function, or Gaussian, or hypersecant. There's all kinds of options there. Uh, what you also have in your V1 uh, field is this, this so-called excitation carrier frequency, right? The energy has to match the spin system, the resonance frequency of the spin system. And if you look at the background again, you'll see that res resonance frequency oscillating. It's a constant oscillation at the larmer frequency whose amplitude is modulated by the pulse envelope function. And then we can choose an initial phase angle. Anytime we're dealing with sines and cosines, there's always some phase that we potentially care about. We'll talk about what that means a little bit later. And then in this case, that's linearly polarized. All that means is you have a V1 field that's oscillating back and forth along, in this case, the I direction, right? And remember that V1 is perpendicular to V0. You'll never see a V1 field that has a K component, at least not in math, not mathematically the way we're going to treat it. So here's one envelope function. Uh, mathematically, uh, rect functions are a little clumsy to work with. This is just saying that you have a V1 envelope function whose magnitude is V1 and it's turned on from some time t equals zero to some time tau p. Uh, again, mathematically, these things are kind of clumsy. It just means that the V1 field is on for some finite duration, and it's zero otherwise. And that has nice for you transform properties that we'll see a little bit later. Uh, sorry, and maybe just going back, then you can see that that radio frequency uh, is tucked inside of this pulse, right? So the actual V1 pulse is oscillating back and forth along the uh, well, it would be the I direction for a linearly polarized field. And we're basically just turning that on, and then we're turning that off. It's a very useful RF pulse, actually. We use this a lot in MR because they're short in duration uh, and can be very useful for certain applications. Um, another uh, RF pulse that we'll see a fair bit of is a sync function. Again, some of these things are a little awkward to deal with mathematically, but here we're just saying that we have a V1 envelope function, function of time, that has an amplitude V1, and it behaves like a sync function. So the sync function just says that it has a certain oscillatory behavior uh, from when we turn it on to when we turn it off. Um, and these functions are used uh, a lot also because, uh, again, they have interesting frequency properties or Fourier tra transform properties in that the bandwidth of these pulses can be relatively narrow. So they have a kind of a narrow and discrete range of frequencies, not just the larger frequency, but the larger frequency plus or minus tens of kilohertz or uh, maybe more or less. And that ends up being useful um, when we get into imaging and slice selection and so forth. Okay, so I, I've suggested that what we really want is a circularly polarized field, but what I just showed you was a linearly polarized field. It was linearly polarized because you saw it only had the I component, so it's just oscillating along a single direction. Linear polarization is simple, mathematically simple to build, so it's cheap. Uh, unfortunately, it, it ultimately means that you have higher R of power. So the amount of, the amount of energy going into the subject for the same effect uh, in this case, what we care about is tipping spins. We're going to have to put more energy into the system um, uh, relative to, say, a circularly polarized field. Uh, we can generate that circularly polarized field with the quadrature RF transmit coil, that birdcage coil that I showed you before. It's a little bit more complex, a little more expensive to build, but it's by far the standard at this point. And the goal here is, or the angle at least, is that you have reduced RF power deposition. So you won't heat up the patient as much for the same uh, goal, the same flip angle that you want. And at least sort of uh, maybe one simple analogy, if it doesn't already make sense, is you have a, let's say you have a, you're at the park, you have a merry-go-round, right? You can either push that merry-go-round in a single direction, standing next to it, right? And that'll be a, a pretty good way to sort of get it going. But the other thing you can do is hold on to it and run around with it. And if you're running around with it, you're circularly polarized. You're constantly pushing on the merry-go-round, right? It's a much more efficient way to get the thing going. Uh, whereas a linearly polarized uh, uh, method is not quite as good. It's you're going to have to put in more power to sort of get it going the same frequency if you want. Not perfect analogy, but reasonable. OK, so the linearly polarized field, the thing that we talked about before, is just a field, V1 field that's bouncing back and forth, right? That means you have maybe two rungs to your system, and you're exciting, you're running current through this rung, and then current through this rung, and current through this rung, and current through this rung. Whereas a circularly polarized field, uh, sorry, going back, uh, uh, the linearly polarized field is just going to oscillate back and forth. It turns out that the linearly polarized field can mathematically be represented as the superposition of two circularly polarized fields. And so 
we can describe one clockwise circular polarized field as follows. It still has an, the same envelope function. It's still V1 uh, envelope of T. But here it's cosine uh, minus a sine term. And what that will mean if you plug in time and some carrier frequency is that you actually get a clockwise uh, polarization of your V1 field. Now mathematically or physically, you can add on a counterclockwise circular polarization field. The only difference between them is the sign in front of the sign, right? This is a minus sign term and this has a plus sign term. If you add those two terms together, you can see that the sign terms would drop off and you would just end up with exactly the linearly polarized field. So what's, what's the point? Well, one point is just to say you can decompose that linear field into two circularly polarized fields. You could, if you wanted to, build two uh, nested V1 coils that had uh, this action and could be driven like a circularly polarized field, the net effect of which would be to produce a linearly polarized field, but there's not an especially good reason to do that. So first generation MR systems used linear polarization. It was easy, it was simple, they built them. Uh, if we look more carefully what happens or what is happening as a consequence of these two other fields, the clockwise field is uh, on resonance, uh, yeah, it's on resonance, and it produces both excitation and heating. So you're going to excite the spins, but there's some energy that's going to go into the subject as well. And so modern systems only use the clockwise circular polarization field. Why? Well, if you look at the counterclockwise circularly polarized field, it's very off resonance, right? So the spin system is rotating one way, and this clockwise circular polarized field is, is rotating with the spin system. So effectively, mathematically, uh, it's the only um, component of the B1 field that you really need to invoke uh, excitation uh, with minimum heating. This field over here is actually off resonance, right? It's rotating in the opposite direction of the spin system. So while your spins are going clockwise, this counterclockwise field is, is flying by in the opposite direction. It's so off resonance, it doesn't contribute to excitation at all, because it's not the same frequency, if you will. Uh, it's different by, by a sign, right? Uh, but it does contribute a lot to heating. And so the bottom line is you can actually just not use that field, you turn off all of that heating, you effectively get uh, the same uh, amount of excitation more efficiently from just using the circular polarization field. So that's what we use uh, uh, more generally now. Okay, so um, what we're building up to is understanding sort of the mathematics of forced precession in the laboratory frame uh, without relaxation. Um, what I'm going to show you here, uh, our goal today is to get into the rotating frame, right? We're going to get into the rotating frame and sort of never look back. But I haven't, uh, at least in my mind, I haven't convinced you uh, that the laboratory frame really sort of creates a headache for us. I'm going to show you why that's the case right now. So we're going to we're going to work through this example here pretty quickly, just on the slides, to show you that it's complicated, and then we'll get closer to the uh, talking about free and forced precession, but moving into the rotating frame. So this is what forced precession in the rotating uh, in the lab frame looks like. Okay, unfortunately that's not going to play. What you would see is this, what I usually call a spiral or sort of a, um, sort of like a beehive, where the both magnetization is pointing straight up and it spirals around because of precession, but it eventually lies down into the transverse plane uh, as a consequence of that B1 field. So it sort of traces out this kind of helix that, as it goes to lying down in the transverse Sorry, that's not showing up. Mathematically, we have uh, the equation of motion uh, for the bulk magnetization on top. And what we have to consider is what's the applied B field, right? So now we're talking about two things, application of a B0 field, application of a B1 field at the same time. Uh, and so uh, we have to take out the envelope function terms that we had from before. Those were the, or, or, or the, um, the descriptors of the B1 field that we had before, not just the envelope function, but the whole time variant. And so we have an X component to our V1 field, we have a Y component to our V1 field, and then we have the, B, the external V0 field. And we can plug that in uh, here, which just shows for us, uh, uh, if, I, if I carry out the cross product that's in the determinant there, I get the system differential equations. What's the problem? Well, a couple things. Mostly you have this complex coupling, right? So my GM X DT, so the time varying X component of my bolt magnetization, depends on my MY component, and my MZ component. So all three components are linked. 
right? Same thing here. My MY component's linked to my MX and my MZ component. That's not easy to deal with. My MZ component, again, is linked with my Y, uh, sorry, my MX component and my MY component. So uncoupling that system of the differential equations for general solutions is, is not possible. There are some, some simple examples for which it is possible, but we're not going to uh, even work through those. Uh, should show up here. Uh, so imagine, uh, as we saw before, that our B1 field is actually uh, written out like this. Some envelope function plus a cosine term minus a sine term, that clockwise circularly polarized field. Uh, if we plug that B1 field into that set of differential equations up above, this really represents a, a headache for us, right? Again, they're coupled, it's complicated, no easy solutions um, to, to that set of, uh, of differential equations. And so the point is that force precession in the laboratory frame without relaxation doesn't lend itself to sort of working things out on the board. We can solve this in simulation. We can solve this through MATLAB. We'll do some related things in your first homework assignment. That's the last thing we'll talk about today, actually, is how to get that off the ground. So my only point is that we're not, we're not going to deal with this problem, uh, deal with trying to solve this system of equations. What we are going to do is show you a trick for how we go in from the laboratory frame, of which this is a mathematical representation, into the so-called rotating frame, where we're spinning around with the, with the spin system. And what that will allow us to do is actually simplify the set of differential equations and get to solutions that are meaningful and easy for us to look at. So that's kind of our, our goal. This is too complicated. Maybe there's another way. And so that other way is introducing this idea of the rotating frame uh, coordinate system. There's a, there's a lot that I used to go into for this. I think what I might end up doing um, later tonight or later this week is I'll post some notes. If you want to know the nitty gritty detail of the coordinate transformation from lab to rotating frame, I'll, I'll probably put some, some notes up about that later. I'll go through at a kind of a high level just to conceptually kind of tell you what that's all about, but then we'll, we'll get into a space where we can start talking about solutions again. So that's kind of the goal right now. Um, so again, remember in the laboratory frame, we have this fixed coordinate system and our rotational angular uh, velocity is governed by gamma b0 and this k. This is the conventional expression, or the, the vector expression from the uh, normal equation in the laboratory frame. Uh, again, I think my movies are not going to work, but try. Uh, so what you should see, man, this is really a bummer. So on the left-hand side is the laboratory frame, and that's when you would have seen the bulk magnetization spiraling around and then tipping down. Uh, what happens in the rotating frame is we get into this spin system, we rotate with the spin system, and now that processional behavior is no longer apparent to us as an observer, right? And so in the rotating frame, the bulk magnetization just appears to tip straight down, right, along some axis. And mathematically, that's a lot easier for us to write down. It's not uh, mutating plus precession, it's just simply mutation. And that's, uh, in getting into the rotating frame, that's what we're uh, sort of able to do now. Uh, important to this, though, is recognizing that the z-axis, or the z-prime axis, also called the k-axis, k-prime axis, those are all the same, right? Those are all pointing along the same direction, and that simplifies some things so down the road as well. Um, so, this one's going to work. Okay, so this is all we're really talking about, right? In the laboratory frame, we have an x and a y coordinate system. In the rotating frame, we have an x-prime and a y-prime coordinate system that are rotating at the level. Seems easy enough. Conceptually, I think you probably get that. Mathematically, it gets a little cumbersome, uh, but then it leads to some uh, cleaner results when we get moving further down the road. And so, uh, just by definition, and this is the, the, I won't go through the details of the derivation, but I want to get you guys on the, on the right page at least. We can write down um, the coordinate transformation between the rotating frame and the laboratory frame. So on the left hand, uh, on the left -hand side, uh, these coordinates here are the rotating frame coordinates. We use prime to talk about the rotating frame coordinate system. And on the uh, right-hand side of this set of equations, you just see the conventional i hat, j hat, k hat. And so they're just re related to one another through a rotation. Uh, from the previous lecture, you might recognize a matrix operator that could act on the i, j, k components to give you the i prime, j prime, k prime components. It's just a rotation. The right-hand side is just the inverse of that. How do we go from how do we describe uh, the laboratory coordinate frame uh, with regard to the, uh, to the rotating coordinate frame? So there's a sine and cosine relationship between them that depends, of course, on what's the moment you can see of the spin system. Um, we can talk about the bulk magnetization in the rotating frame, and we can talk about the B field in the rotating frame. It's the same vector, right? The M vector is still the M vector. The M vector is still pointing in whatever direction with whatever magnitude it has. 
coordinate frames are all just about different perspectives on that same vector, right? So the bulk magnetization and the rotating frame, we can write it as being mx prime, my prime, mz prime, but it's still the same bulk magnetization vector. And the same with the B field, the whatever externally applied B field we have, right? So we have, in the rotating frame, we can just write it component-wise in terms of its x prime, y prime, z prime components, fine. Uh, and then just remembering that because that z axis is shared, then we have certain identities, which just says that any B field that we have shares the z component, any bulk magnetization vector that we have shares the z component. So it's kind of a 2D problem in that it's most of the dependencies fall into the xy uh, components. Okay, so what we ultimately want to be able to show, and I'm not going to take a lot of time in this, in this specific lecture to do so, is that there's two different equations of motion. The one we derived last time, I guess, which was the equation of motion for an ensemble of spins in the so-called laboratory frame. If we go through this whole coordinate system transformation rigmarole, we end up being able to redefine the equation of motion. And it doesn't look all that different, but it's in different in some important ways. Now we're talking about the time rate of change of bulk magnetization in the rotating frame, fine. We're, still, we're talking about the bulk magnetization in the rotating frame. It's still a cross product of gamma times a B field. So gamma is the same, that's okay. And then we have this kind of funny looking B field that's in the middle here now. And conceptually what's happening is you're gonna have your externally applied B field, B rope. So this is your B0 field plus your B1 field, it could be your gradient fields. It's everything that we apply. And it's basically just offset or demodulated by this other term, what we call omega rope by gamma. But omega rope by gamma is just that processional frequency, right? Or, it's, or it's, it's the field driving the processional frequency. And so this term is, is basically a constant, and it's always going to offset that B0 field, the actual applied B0 field. And in that way, you're adding processional frequency because of the applied B field, but then you're, you'll see how the signs work out later, but you're effectively offsetting it by adding this term here. This is the, the main term that does the transformation the origins of which are maybe not entirely obvious, but if you have added a large frequency because of the B0 field, we effectively need to take, get, get rid of that large frequency when we do that with this omega rope term again. You'll see, so I'll, I'll go, I think it'll be a little bit more clear when I go through the working examples. Um, we can collapse those two terms into what we call the B effective. And so the B effective is the B field that the bulk magnetization experiences in the rotating frame, right? So we jumped in with the spin system and we all know it's precessing around, but we don't really care about that anymore because it's not part of our observational framework. We just care about the B, the effective B field, what's happening to the spin system in the rotating frame. And for the most part, that's equivalent to uh, the normal MR experiment is going to be B0 plus B1, but the B effective field is just really B1, right? We're going to demodulate the, the, what the B0 field is doing to our spin system. And so that shows up here. We have the so-called fictitious field that demodulates the apparent effect of B0. This is always going to be in place. And then we have the applied B field, but we have to put it in the right coordinate frame. So this is our B0 plus our B1 plus whatever applied fields we have. We just have to describe them in the right coordinate system. And the right coordinate system is the so-called rotating frame coordinate system. Okay, so that maybe sort of kind of makes sense. We're trying to get rid of this high frequency stuff that we don't observe in the rotating frame. Mathematically, that's how we do it. I think the working examples will probably make the theory a little bit more clear. Um, and so what we end up with in the end is just a different expression for the equation of motion for the, uh, for the spin system, for bulk magnetization. Looks a lot like the expression we had last, last time. There, you know, for better or for worse, there's just a lot of mathematics to actually get to that single expression now. Again, the, the working examples, I think, would make it a little bit more obvious. So where are we headed? Well, we're headed towards describing free precession in the rotating frame, and then ultimately forced precession in the rotating frame. Working through free precession won't take us that long. It's probably a five minute exercise. Working through forced precession will take us longer. That's probably 20 minutes of working on the board. Uh, and if all goes well, we'll have uh, 10 or 15 minutes at the end to talk about the first one. Uh, but we'll take a quick minute. Okay. Sorry about the videos. I'm not sure if that's all about that.
Oh, it keeps moving. So uh, let me get going here. So again, the goal here is to talk about pre-procession in the rotating frame. We're still in the absence of relaxation. I put that there just because obviously at some point we're going to introduce the idea of relaxation. So what's the B field that we that we care about? Again, it's just pre-procession, right? And so there's only one B field that we care about. And so we just write that our B field is D0 and magnitude along with K hat direction. This is sort of a trivial example, but it's a maybe it's a warm-up, right? Uh, we know that the two K directions are shared, so that's the same. In the rotating frame, it's just k hat, right? So this would be the lab frame, and this would be the rotating frame. Easy enough. We know those directions are shared. Uh, by definition, then uh, that means that the B field in the rotating frame, which we subscript B root, is just equivalent to the original B field. Because those axes are shared, the vectors are the B fields. Uh, in one of the previous lectures, we talked about an expression for the Larmor equation, the full sort of vector expression. It looked like the angular frequency vector was equal to minus gamma times B0. And again, that was in the lab frame. Uh, we can make an easy transformation to the rotating frame because we just changed coordinates to gamma to minus gamma B0 and the K at prime direction. So that's same thing in the rotating frame. Uh, and so by definition, that is also omega. So now we have to think about what's the effective field? What's the B effective in the, uh, for this particular uh, experiment? The general description for the effective B field, that is the B field that you sort of see in the rotating frame, it was defined as being omega root plus B root. This thing on the right-hand side over here, that's that fictitious field, right? We have to add that thing in there to help us demodulate the effects of the rotating frame. Um, and so now we, we know what our, uh, uh, we know uh, that our omega root, we know that our omega root here is just equal to uh, uh, minus gamma B0 K. So we can just like, make a substitution here to say uh, omega rho is equal to minus gamma B0 K hat prime all by gamma plus our B rho, and our B rho is just B0 and the K hat prime. It might be useful if I should have done these things. So this is my first equation. What's the result of that? Well, that's just two fields that are equal, right? Uh, the so-called fictitious field and then the, the B field in the rotating frame, uh, they add to give us zero. So what does that mean? Well, that just means that there's really no B effective right, uh, for on resonance spins. The absence of other B fields. Um, okay, so what, is, what does that mean? What does that sort of physically mean? It means that we're, when we're in the when we're in the rotating frame, and the only externally applied field is the B zero field, we don't see any effect. We're rotating at the armor frequency, the spins are rotating at the armor frequency, the spins are on resonance. We don't see any effect from that. Uh, how does that bear out if we use that in the actual equation of motion? So then we go back to that uh, equation of motion in the rotating frame, where we have the partial of the m rho vector uh, with respect to time. And just this is just the first expression. Um, so for just the, the simple rotating frame expression for the equation of motion. So it's the bulk magnetization of the rotating frame crossed with gamma times, again, that 
fictitious field, omega root uh, in root, plus uh, B that is the general expression. But now we know that our B effective field, which is all this stuff here, right? this is just B effective, that's just zero. So again, I said this is going to give us something relatively trivial, and it will, right? We just have a BM root vector as a cross product with gamma times a zero vector. Because that whole field inside there, uh, we said just a second ago, the B effective is zero. And so what does that mean? Uh, it means that the time rate of change of the bulk magnetization in the, ro in the rotating frame is zero. And so, uh, so therefore, you could Magnetization as a function of time, which is equal to say some constant j. And by that, it just means that uh, the m rope vector, the bulk magnetization vector, again in that rotating frame, is stationary. So again, in some ways, you know, maybe not a terribly interesting result, but this is this is kind of the main result. For that simple case, right? We're just talking about only having the externally applied B0 field. And so that fictitious field effectively cancels out that B0 field. Does that make sense? So again, not a, not a terribly interesting example. Uh, what we're really interested in is what happens in the context of forced precession, right? And so that's uh, that's sort of the next and, and, and more involved uh, example of what we're going to So questions about how that landed before I scroll up a bit. Okay. The trick is really in figuring out what is B effective, right? For a particular problem, what is the B effective? In this example, we'll, uh, we'll introduce an RF pulse and then things get a little bit more complicated. Okay, so we talked about RF pulses a second ago. I'll introduce this as a, as a new problem here. And the general expression that we gave for the B1, pul uh, B1 pulse, so it's a vector. As a function of time. And it had different sort of components to it. The first thing was this B1 envelope function, which could be a function of time. That was that sync function or whatever else. Right? And that operated on, for example, something like cosine times omega pi f. Um, we can introduce, uh, sorry, times time. We can introduce a phase, so there could be a theta there as well. And that's all along, say, the i hat direction. And the other component was similar, but just a minus sign. So we have a minus sign times omega pi f times time uh, plus theta. And this is the other component, so it's acting along, say, the j direction. Remember, the B1 pulses are perpendicular to B0. They act on the i and the j direction and the k direction. <coughs> and that closes out the description of the B1 pulse. But again, this is all in the lab frame. So the first thing we have to do is go from, this is, the, this is physically the thing that you and I generate when we excite the V1 coil, but mathematically we've got to jump into the rotating frame. How do we do that? Uh, we have to transform, uh, for example, these I hat and J hat uh, components into I hat prime and J hat prime components in the so-called rotating frame. We'll do a couple things to make our life a little bit easier. The first thing we'll do is we'll just say, let's just let theta equal to zero. And the other thing you have it in your notes, but I'll write it down for reference, is you have to remember what's the definition of i hat with respect to the rotating frame. And so by definition, that was just cosine omega t uh, on i hat prime plus sine omega t uh, on j hat prime. And the uh, more for j hat, which by definition is just minus sine omega t. Remember these, I think this will be useful a little bit later. So, sorry, if this is equation one, and this is equation two, and this is equation three. Okay, so now we have to basically uh, substitute uh, two and three into one, right? So, so, the step is to sub into one, and that's going to end up, you're, you probably can do it faster uh, without listening and watching me, but. 
And so by substitution, you'll end up with this uh, B1 field. The goal is to get into the rotating frame. That's what this next step is going to do. And that's going to be equal to B1 function, which is a function of time. And this gets kind of long, so I'm not sure if I'll fit it onto one line. Uh, but we have a cosine uh, omega r drop my phase term, and now I have to drop in the substitution for my uh, I hat uh, component, right? So that's a cosine omega t I hat prime plus sine omega t j hat prime. Uh, and then I won't have space uh, in my notes here, but I'll write the next term underneath, which is just coming back to the so the last term of equation one, and that's just the sine of omega r hat times time, and now times j uh, hat, uh, but this time in the rotating frame, and so we're at a minus sine omega t uh, hat prime direction, uh, plus the cosine of omega t And then we have to close all that back. So it makes up with the expression above. And we'll call that equation here. OK, so uh, thankfully, and as, as is usually the case, I'm going to scroll up a little bit probably up here. Uh, as is usually the case, we have things like cosine and sine squared and cosine squared terms showing up and some other trig identities. And so uh, if you don't remember, uh, I can write it here. Uh, I don't know if you guys have taken the GRD more recently. Uh, but we can have the, something like the cosine of alpha, sine of alpha minus uh, the sine of alpha times the cosine of alpha. And what does that equal? Anyone remember? What's that? That's going to be helpful. Okay. Uh, so where does that where does that show up? Uh, we're going to just try to collect and simplify some terms, right? We have a bunch of i hat terms. We have a bunch of j hat terms. Yeah, yeah. I hat terms can all go together. The j hat terms. The J hat prime and I hat prime terms can all go together, right? And so then we return to trying to simplify this thing. We still have our B1 envelope function as a function of time. And we'll end up with, in front, uh, I'll, I'll write it this way, at least there's a cosine squared term uh, to carry out the, uh, just the multiplication of the cos functions. This should all be omega RF, I guess. Sorry, I got a little sloppy there. Uh, so this should look like omega RF times time. Uh, direction plus thankfully the sine square and the omega RF prime, which is also I hat direction. And the rest of the stuff that's in there just ends up giving us a zero. And so because of that trade over the omega times all the kind of other stuff there. But there will be some combined cosine sine and sine cosine terms that will come back to us. So uh, again, I sort of said it, but we've got now a cosine squared and a sine squared term. That's always nice for us, right? Because that just gives us one. And so the result of that substitution is that the, uh, uh, the final B1 field is just B1 envelope of T on the I hat prime direction. And so uh, that's the definition of the B1 field in the rotating frame uh, for the particular RF pulse that we described. So uh, you could say that in the rotating frame, uh, the B1 uh, pushes in a single direction, pushes back and forth in a single direction. Now we can have more complicated RF pulses, obviously. The pulse that we chose, uh, if you look at the envelope function, very top right now. It was also it was rotating around at the longer frequency. The effect of that pulse in the rotating frame was just to push along a single direction, the so-called I hat prime direction. Now we we didn't get into it. We'll, we'll see it show up uh, when we kind of come back to the slides. But we can't really ignore this theta term the whole time. The theta tells us what's the orientation or what's the phase of the RF pulse. So if I want to, with my bulk magnetization, I can tip my magnetization down this way, so I can push it, say, to the 
but got, I can also push it out towards you guys, right, away from you guys. And what governs uh, the direction that I'm rotating around, right, is the phase of the all out pulse. We'll see that show up mathematically uh, in quarter of time. Okay, so now uh, we have a, uh, a description, right, of what the B1 field looks like in the rotating frame. We have to substitute that back into our equation of motion if we want to start talking about uh, some of the, uh, uh, sort of what happens in, in close frame solutions. So, what's our B1 effective now that we can write this in the, uh, the rotating frame uh, coordinate system? Remember that we have our B1 effective, again, just by definition, or it's this omega rho, the so called fictitious field divided by gamma, plus the B field described in the rotating frame. Well, this is good because we just figured out what the B1 field looks like. Previous will probably work through, you know, would be zero looks like in the rotating frame. So we should be able to knock this out pretty well. And so uh, we again, by definition, the, the things that we showed in the previous example, we know that this fictitious field is the same as minus gamma B0 K hat prime uh, by gamma. Some things are going to cancel out there. And now we have to put together our, our uh, B field in the rotating frame. It's a B0 field and a B1 field because, again, our goal here is forced precession in the rotating frame. And so what's our B rope look like this time? Well, it still has the B0 field, so that's B0 on K hat time. And now it has the B1 field, so it's just the superposition of those two fields. And that second field is just the B1 envelope as a function of time along the I hat prime direction. So we have two orthogonal fields. <coughs> second field is what we just um, and uh, perhaps not surprisingly, there's a bunch of terms there. The leading two terms in the k hat direction, k hat prime direction, rather, are going to cancel each other. We're going to demodulate the effects of the B0 field, and we're just left with the effects of the B1 field. And so your B1, um, your B1 field here uh, is just the B1 envelope function as a function of time, oscillating back and forth in the hat direction. And I realize you guys should have caught. So this business here, this is the B1 effective term. This should be B effective. And so the main result is just this. Uh, the, the effective B field in the rotating frame is just that. It's, it looks a lot like just the pulse envelope. So we've got the all the B0. Okay, so that's only uh, half the battle, right? That was all of that energy was just to help us understand what is the B field in the rotating frame, frame or what's the effective B field. Uh, what we need to turn to now is using that effective B field in the equation of motion, right? So our equation of motion was dm rho uh, by dt, and that was equal to m rho cross gamma the effective. So this is our expression today in the rotating frame for uh, equation of motion. But we know what B1 effective looks like now because we just put that through. So this is just equal to M rho cross with uh, the gamma B1 envelope function. It's a function of time. Uh, so this, this looks uh, maybe not too terrible. We could write this out in sort of the, uh, the determinant form just to see what the system of equation is, is actually going to look like. And across the top, we have I hat, uh, this should be I hat prime, uh, J hat prime, K hat prime. Our uh, bulk magnetization components are just MX prime, MY prime, and Z prime. Now the somewhat interesting and different thing is we have a different B field. This B field is just on this I hat direction, right? The I hat prime direction. And so we just have a, a gamma B1 envelope of T term here. There is no K component, it's just zero. And there is no, uh, sorry, there's no J component, uh, and there's no K component either. And so this looks, you know, at least by, by my eye, this looks similar. To uh, forced, uh, sorry, free precession 
this in terms of a, being a system of equations. It's ordered a little bit differently, uh, but it looks similar to that. So we, we kind of know where the, where the solution to that's, that's headed. We're going to have a coupled system of differential equations. We're going to need some tricks to uncouple them. Uh, and ultimately, it will tell us about how this B1 envelope function acts on the bulk magnetization to tip it over, for example. Um, if we carry through writing out the actual uh, individual uh, differential equations, then we just have a dmx prime dt. Uh, but the one we're talking about here is uh, my prime times zero minus mz prime times zero. Does that make sense? That comes out of a cross product. And so this is just the zero component. Not too interesting. Uh, the next one we care about uh, writing down is just the dmy prime dt. And that comes out of a different cross product. Um, so here we're going to talk about the, let's see, the j component. So the dmz zero term, and the dm of b1, d of t, and the z term. So we write that down in the uh, dm one uh, b1 envelope of t. And then we just write down the last equation, which is the k component, if you will, or the dz component, so we have dmz prime dt. And then coming out of the uh, determinant is minus gamma. Minus gamma b1 envelope of t times m. So this looks, uh, again, we said it before, it looks uh, similar to what some of we saw before. We just have a coupled system. Ordinary differential equations, and that's that. We have some machinery for for, for dealing with. Uh, we, we can see on the last two questions that m y is coupled to m z, m z is coupled to m y, but our m x components not doing anything. Okay, so we're going to move on to the Okay, so uh, this is a little bit different, and so I want to I do want to work through some of the steps again. Um, uh, relative to, to the last problem, but the solution is going to look similar. We're going to be looking for sines and cosines and things like that again. Um, and so, uh, what's the what's the solution? Well, let's let's pick an initial condition. So, so if our initial condition, let's spell it. So, initial condition is something like mx prime of zero is equal to zero. We don't have any x component to begin with. Our my prime of zero is equal to zero. We also don't have any my component. And then our mz prime of zero component is equal to mz zero, some initial condition. Uh, and at perfect equilibrium, if we haven't sort of otherwise perturbed the system previously, we might just call that m1. That's the maximum amount of available bulk magnetization. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of steps here to actually work through the, the actual solution to that system of equations because what's different this time is that our B1 on this, this term here in the middle, the B1 envelope function is a function of time. We don't know what that function is. It could be anything. It could be a sink function. It could be a rect function. It could be a Gaussian. It could be all kinds of things. And so that complicates, in part, the, the form of the solution that we're, that we're looking for uh, to, to uh, get an answer out of that system of differential equations. Um, the form that we begin guessing with looks like this. We say, well, what if my prime of t looks something like a cosine? And again, if you've taken differential equations before, but you have, there's different ways to get at this, but this is one possible uh, guess. What if that looks like the integral of that b1 envelope function of time to t? Uh, there, sorry. Plus b times sine of the integral of that b1 envelope function as a function of time. And that might not be a totally obvious choice to begin with, but we'll see a little bit that it ends up being pretty convenient for us. So the first thing we'll do is just take the time derivative of that function, dmy 
the sines are going to change to sines, or sines are going to change to cosines, which just becomes minus a sine of some stuff, right? Plus You have the A, but then coming out of the, uh, you take the derivative using the chain rule of what's inside the sign, and you have a gamma E1 times sine of that stuff. Right? And then the second term is just going to look like plus B using the chain rule, the derivative of the stuff inside the sign. That just looks like gamma E1. <coughs> me. Uh, times your uh, sine goes to cosine of that same stuff. And so this was just by way of taking the time derivative. Uh, we can simplify some things if we, if, we, uh, if we just call this alpha inside here. And we'll see what that, that's actually is the flip angle. So if you know a little bit about MR already, this is where the flip, the definition of the flip angle starts showing up. So the substitution that we really made there was just saying that alpha is equal to the integral of gamma e1 over t. t. Saves me a little bit of handwriting in uh, your solace as well. Um, if, I, um, if I go back to what my, uh, if I go back to using my my original differential system of differential equations, I have a connection between uh, d and y, right? So showing up here, I have a connection between uh, the time rate of change of the mz component and the time rate of change in the my component. We can substitute that in uh, at this point, and you can get that our uh, d and y dt term here is just equal to gamma and b or envelope time times mz time. That's just the expression that we have. Uh, so let's think again about our mz prime term. Uh, it looks something like minus a times sine of alpha. We now make that substitution plus b uh, cos of alpha. Um, we have an interesting initial condition where we say that mz prime of t equal to zero is uh, sorry. Uh, that's also where the flip angle is equal to zero. At equilibrium, we haven't begun to tip the spin system over. Alpha is equal to zero, our time is equal to zero, uh, and then our mz is just going to be equal, uh, equal to b uh, from the expression that's just to the left there, and that's equal to our initial condition. So all we did there is just solve for what is b. We still need to figure out uh, what could a possibly be. So we go back to our my uh, expression, uh, our time t equals to zero, and we get a cos alpha plus b. But, again, at this point in time, alpha is equal to zero uh, at time equal to zero. Uh, and so that means that this expression really is just equal to a. And that just means that, our, that a is equal to zero, so we don't have that component uh, in our final solution. That coefficient knocks out that entire term. So what, is that, what does all that mean? Well, if you follow the steps there, and again, I don't force too much of the solution strategy on you. What we care about is the solutions uh, even more so. We could write out uh, the solution to that coupled set of differential equations. Thing. And so this is really maybe the take home result from all of, all of this rigmarole. Uh, and for the specific B0 and B1 field that we applied, we know that our, our mx prime is a function of time. is just equal to whatever the initial condition was. And for those, the, setup that we described, we said, well, initially, maybe it's just zero. And so nothing too interesting happening on MX. So what's happening on MY and MZ? Well, that's where the interesting business is, so to speak. So our MY prime uh, is a function of time. We just figured out what A is, we figured out what B is. And here's where we see the initial state of the MZ magnetization actually entering into the MY expression. And so it's just MZ naught times sine of integral. Here we can write it more explicitly with the, the limits. So times gamma B1 envelope 
Is there a rotating frame for this one? Yep. Yeah, so uh, if I have not done so carefully, everything should have a prime on it. I apologize if that didn't uh, bear out. Is there out. M1 see if there's an M2 and zero? Yeah, so this is, yeah, so this expression here, uh, you're talking about this right here? Yeah, so that should be an M1 prime. Everything's in the road, oops, everything's in the rotating frame. We made that transformation sort of I and J and I and J transformation. We'll talk about what the solutions would mean in just a second. But don't, don't hesitate to sort of point out uh, problems like that. Um, and so, sorry, just lastly writing out that NZ prime is a function of time is NZ zero times cosine of the integral from zero to T. So usually the P1 envelope function is on from some time zero, less than or equal to some time t, less than or equal to some time tau and tau and tau. That could mean different things. You could have a simple um, a P1 envelope function right, that just looks something like this. It's just turned on, it's just turned off. So this is from zero to say it's something. High frequency oscillations, of course, inside that. But that's the simplest, amongst the simplest arm pulses that we need to deal with. Um, okay, so what are those, what does that system of equations really say for us? It says that if we have an applied B0 field and an applied B1 field that has that sort of cosine and sine form that we showed you before, then, and it's, and it's, uh, uh, then in the, in the rotating frame, my x prime component's not changing. My my component is increasing as a function of time. The sine gets bigger and bigger and bigger. It's tipping down. And my mz component is getting smaller and smaller and smaller because of the cosine of this term. We'll, we'll work through this a little bit more, but you'll see that everything that's inside the sine and cosine, that's effectively the flip angle. It's that P1 envelope function is forcing the bulk magnetization to do something. The, the sort of path that it takes to do that something depends on the sign of the integral of the B1 function. Not entirely obvious, but it's sort of worn out there in the math. In the rotating frame, what you might picture is if this is the bulk magnetization, uh, maybe I don't have any X component to begin with, and as it's tipping over, I never have an X component, right? Because I've tipped it along a certain direction. I've tipped it, in fact, about the X prime or the I so that component's always zero. That just means you're rotating about that axis. You never had a component, and never gets a component. And so the bulk magnetization is just increasing along my, a function of sine of what's inside there, and mz is decreasing. It's a function of cosine of the view, effectively the view of the function inside. Um, I'm not sure why that movie seemed to work today. I'll make some of that more clear when I show you some of the animations. But that's the conceptual picture you should have. Uh, so. What's the symbol that you have? Uh, it's kind of like a tau. Yeah, so so I just had a so here I just wanted to put limits on the integral. Yeah. I probably should actually put this as zero to the, uh, tau rf. Because okay. right? we're talking about a specific so sorry. Yeah. And then put the in this uh, here I'll do it just so it stands out. This should be a tau rf. Sorry for that. It's okay. Okay, so that was a fair bit of work to sort of uh, show what happens as a consequence of an RF pulse in the, in the rotating frame. Let me see where we are again, time-wise. I'll probably come back um, and revisit some of this uh, at the beginning of the next lecture. That shouldn't, I want to talk, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about that. So I'll hold off on going through the, the rest of the examples that I have there. Uh, uh, we'll come back to uh, uh, go through a few of the slides quickly, I think, and then we'll talk some about them. Is that okay? So, so what's the point that we actually got to there? Well, the point that we got to uh, was uh, 
we, we looked carefully at free precession in the rotating frame, got this kind of uninteresting quick answer, nothing really happens, right? And then we took a B1 pulse, redefined it in the rotating frame, it got a little complicated with sine squared and cosine squared, dropped out a bunch of terms, solved a set of differential equations that looked a little bit familiar before, and got the solution to force precession in the rotating frame. Now, that's a, that's a pretty important consideration for us because a lot of what we care about in this class is uh, we care mostly about the rotating frame uh, because that's where this, this kind of arguably the simplest descriptions of what's going on occur. Uh, we can sort of understand the mathematics a little bit more easily, believe it or not. Um, and then we'll, we'll get to talking about relaxation later. We'll also care about free precession, but only when we add relaxation. Force precession of the rotating frame, we basically consider through during the application of RF pulse. Right? So RF pulses are forced precession, easiest for you, most easily described in the rotating frame. The other condition that we really care about is free precession, but only when we start adding relaxation. And that's when the system's kind of returning to its equilibrium state, having forced it to do something with, with a B1 pulse and RF pulse. So that's just kind of looking down the road a little bit as to where we're headed. I want to talk a little bit about RF pulses, and this will lead us into talking a little bit about your first homework assignment. Uh, so, um, RF pulses have a flip angle. We saw that a little bit just a second ago. So the, the, the final result there, we had a cosine of this integral and a sine of this integral. That integral, the B1 envelope function, tells you about the RF pulse. The longer the B1 pulse is on, the more I'm going to tip over. The stronger the B1 pulse is, the faster I'm going to tip. So it's that combination of strength and duration is how far I'm going to tip my spin system over. But, so that's the flip angle. Business of all of this. Well, we didn't really talk about much there because I said let's just drop it so we don't have to sort of carry it through mathematically the whole time. It's a so called phase, but it is important. Uh, what is the phase? Well, the phase is the axis of which, about which the B1 pulse is oriented. When we put together that RF pulse, I think we put together, we had an, uh, an I and a J term, but we knocked out the, the phase term. If we have a phase term, if the phase is zero, let's consider the simplest case, which is really what we did just a second ago. So let's ignore it. It's the same thing as setting it to zero. By definition, when, when theta is zero, when the RF phase is zero, in the rotating frame, you're phasing your RF pulse to tip along, left hand rule for B1 pulses, along about the x axis. So I'm forcing my magnetization to rotate around the x axis. If I choose to have a phase of 90 degrees, then I rotate it by 90 degrees. My thumb now points along y, and I'm forcing my magnetization over that. Okay? So the phase, the RF phase, tells you about the orientation of that B1 field. It's always I and J components. It's a question of how much I and how much J. The theta, the phase, tells you how much I or how much J do you have in your phase. Um, mathematically, and again, I'll, I'm not sure. Oh, no, these work. These are okay. Mathematically, we'll write this in different ways. Sometimes we just write it as RF. Sometimes we write it as R. We subscript the phase. We superscript the flip angle. So we have... RF theta alpha, and we can just compactly describe what is the phase, what is the alpha, uh, what is the flip angle. So this pulse here, for my bulk magnetization to go from equilibrium to having this uh, orientation, I need an RF pulse of zero phase and 90 degrees at, uh, flip angle. So zero phase points along x. It's going to rotate my bulk magnetization around x and going towards y, total 90 degrees. Sense. Consider the second case. The second case is RF 90-90. My phase is 90. Point my thumb, left hand rule, point my thumb along X, rotate by 90 degrees, so now I'm pointing along Y, and now I flip it over by 90 degrees. And my bulk magnetization that was pointing along Z was torqued over by a B1 pulse. Right? B1, B1 fields exert torques on magnetic dipoles. Tipping my magnetization so that after it's, I've had the B1 on long, long enough to generate 90 degrees of flip, it's pointing along now the minus x direction. If those don't, if those examples don't make sense, try it again tonight when you go home, or uh, when you're on the bus, or when you wake up in the morning, or however you sort of get through your day. Uh, but but those are those will help you sort of conceptualize what that's all about. Mathematically, it gets a little bit a little bit more complicated. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is that B1 fields induce mutation, right? So this is still true, right? This looks like the Larmor equation, but here we're talking just specifically about the B1 field. The spins will rotate in the presence of any D field. 
right? We just happen to use very, very different B fields. We use the B0 field to get precession. We use the B1 field to get mutation, the sort of tipping of the spin system. So just keep that in mind as, as, as both being true. Uh, I'll work through this example a little bit more carefully, uh, probably at the beginning of next lecture. Uh, it showed up a little bit in the solution that we just worked through. We said we have a sign of this integral term. When we integrate the duration uh, and history of the B1 envelope function, that's how long we're applying the B1 pulse and how strong we're applying the B1 pulse. And that, if we integrate that over time, it's a B field multiplied by gamma, we actually get an angle that we call a flip angle. And so again, the longer the flip angle, the stronger the B1 pulse, the more, uh, the larger the flip angle. So maybe no surprise there. Um, in general, when it comes to sort of designing these things, and you'll do this a little bit in your homework, um, we have to spe we usually specify alpha. We usually care what our flip angle is. We want it to be 90 degrees. We want it to be 10 degrees. We want it to be 180 degrees. That's usually the design constraint. And then we have a hardware constraint. We can usually only generate a certain maximum B1 field. So our system's only capable of doing so much. And then the other consideration is you usually want to go as fast as possible. And so if you have an alpha and a B1 max, and you want to go as short as possible, you can usually calculate what you need to calculate. In the case of a, of a simple pulse like this, uh, it's a rect pulse, and so all you really have is the B1 amplitude times its duration. So alpha is just equal to the amplitude times its duration for that simple rect RF pulse. And so you can see how the design considerations work out. Uh, the duration is just going to be the flip angle divided by gamma B1 max. We specify our alpha, pi over 2, keep track of your units, so pi over 2 is 90. And then we have to stuff in the gyromagnetic ratio and whatever the B1 max is for some system. And that tells us that we can achieve this. We can tip our spin system over by pi over 2, 90 degrees, in about 100 microseconds, right? If our B1 system is capable of 60 microtesla. Um, that's pretty high. Uh, what happens if our system's only capable of 20 microtesla? Does this duration go up or down? I can only get 20 microtesla. I've only got that capability for whatever reason. Our, our pulse gets uh, gets longer. Yeah, bigger, longer. Right. So it's going to take me more time to push it that far. Right. Uh, so you can again, you can think through examples like that. You'll see one in your. What gets a little tricky is actually how do we mathematically incorporate both the chosen flip angle, this is what we usually choose. We usually choose the flip angle, we usually choose the theta. How do we describe an operator that will force our bulk magnetization to go where we want it to go if what we specify is the flip angle in the phase? Mathematically, it's not that hard, uh, but it does require uh, some tricks. Uh, we saw this before, um, which was just a rotation operator, right? So this just is a rotation about z. So in this case, the phase is z, if you will. Uh, it's a rotation by 5. That's just a conventional rotation operator. Tells us that the rotation operator acting on a vector will produce a new vector in the new coordinate system. You can think of that as a change of basis. We just did a change of basis to go from the lab frame to the rotating frame. So rotations allow us to describe a change of coordinate systems. It's one way to describe that. Um, what we need, ultimately, to describe the composite action of the phase and the flip angle is three steps. The first thing is a change of basis by theta. We have to rotate into a slightly different coordinate frame. In that coordinate frame, we can more easily understand what the flip angle means, what alpha means, that alpha is tipping this way, that alpha is tipping that way. Conceptually, we do that by rotating by uh, minus the phase angle. That's, that's the first change of basis. The second operator, you'll see how this all composite in a second. The second operator is to rotate by alpha, but in the new coordinate system. That means we need, we need to know if we're applying alpha to go this way or applying alpha to go this way. And we do that through that initial change of basis. That's just a mathematical trick. And so then we have to change the basis back again one more time by the underlying phase. So it's three rotations that give us the action of the flip angle phase that we desire. Why am I showing you all that? Well, it's just so you understand when you look at some of the MATLAB, well, it's two things. One, so you know how to do it. And two, when you look at some of the MATLAB code that you'll need for the first homework assignment, you'll see that the action of an RF pulse that has a phase theta and a flip angle alpha is just the composite action of those different rotation operators. And it looks a little clumsy, but that's where it comes from. It's this 
products of cosine squareds and thetas and alphas and sines and more cosines. Um, so I just want you to understand that that came from somewhere, right? And it's this change of basis flipping and then changing the basis back. You're going to need that operator because I might say, given some bulk magnetization, some flip angle and some phase, where does the bulk magnetization end up? Right? So that's a, a relatively simple design. Um, I know we're sort of running up against the clock here, but let me spend, because I think it's in your best interest, a few minutes talking about the first homework assignment, okay? That's out today, do it a week. Uh, so good to kind of jump on this. Um, a bunch of stuff at the top that just talks about what you have to turn in. Turn in a PDF uh, to me and turn in your code as well, because we can run your code and try to help you figure out you know, what worked and what didn't work. And you're gonna, basically, it's probably easiest to do, the problem is it's very obviously you want to use NATLAB because I'm telling you to. Other problems, it's kind of up to you. Uh, if you just have to give me a numeric answer, you don't have to do it. That way. If you're not sure, just ask me. Um, in the first problem, you're going to be talking mostly about B0 fields and designing a B0 field. So we had a simple expression that talked about the uniformity of the Z component of the B field. And you have to come up with uh, some, uh, you have to design it. Not a, it's not a fully constrained problem. You're going to figure out the currents and the number of turns that will produce a magnetic field that has that meets certain conditions, uh, certain field variations, certain strength, certain length, things like that. How are you going to do that? Well, you can just do it by hand. You can just keep running the code that I've given you until it meets the condition that you care about. Or you can set it up as an optimization problem. It depends what level of coding you do. You can do this by hand, so to speak, in that lab, you know, in 10 minutes probably. If you want to set up a more sophisticated solution, that's also fine. So the first thing is design that field. Tell me some of the characteristics of that field, how uniform, how non-uniform is that field. And then what could you do to improve the field? Your field homogeneity is not going to be great if we're just making the assumption of a solenoid field with kind of constraints on the geometry and so forth. A couple of these problems also have extra credit. Uh, and so you can, you can talk about how you would actually do something can actually show me a solution that does improve the field for example. So this is the code that I'll, that I'll give you. I know there are some problems with the website. I got a message. We'll try to get it sorted out tonight, and I'll just send it to you directly. Um, but this was the code that generated uh, the magnetic fields as a function of Z. So you have a starting point already for getting that problem going. You just have to kind of use that code to get towards uh, the answer. Um, in the questions about that? I think that's not, I think that's relatively straight. Right? I have to play with it for a little while and then I think you'll start getting answers pretty quickly. Yep. Uh, with the PDF, are we writing, or are we submitting a write up for each part of the map in that, or is it just questions that specifically ask for us to just write out? Um, so you're, you're asking when I have to use MATLAB and when I don't have to use MATLAB? Or, uh, what parts do we have to include in the PDF? Right. So uh, the easiest thing to include. For me to, to see you include in PDF is basically like your code. It shouldn't, it's not going to be that long. We're talking sort of like tens of lines or something like that. And then the figure that that code generates or the, or the number that that code generates. Right? So there is a nice function. Um, oh, what's it called? It's not the report function. Publish. Publish. Thank you. Yeah. So if you write a script, a MATLAB script, and you just publish that script to a PDF and send it to me, if that has all the answers in it in a way that we can find them pretty easily, then you're done. And that's probably the easiest thing, because then that's code and figures and answers as you know, two, three-page PDF for you know, one of the problems. So it's the, it's the publish function. Sorry. Um, let me punch through this stuff just so we get there. Uh, Second problem is a little trickier. This is probably the hardest problem, actually. Uh, so here, I'm giving you a B1 operator, and I'm giving you a B0 operator. We haven't talked too much about these operators yet. They're, they're just matrix operators. The matrix acts on a vector, the bulk magnetization, to produce a new state for the bulk magnetization. We saw some rotation operators in the last couple lectures. This is just coded up for you already. So you're sort of using these specific functions to do uh, two different things. This is, a, this is comparing B0 fields and B1 fields and designing a B1 field and then comparing its magnitudes and so forth to the B0 field. What gets a little bit tricky 
is actually generating the plots. So for these two problems here, you're going to generate a plot of what happens to the bulk magnetization. You should have in your head a, a picture already of what happens to the bulk magnetization in the rotating frame and what happens to the bulk magnetization in the, in the laboratory frame. And that's what this problem is, is partly about, comparing laboratory rotating frame and B1 field versus B0 fields. Um, but if there's a, you know, in my view, I think that's probably the, the trickier of the two problems. Um, you'll see this if you look inside the code. This is just the RF pulse operator that I just told you about. This is a slightly more complicated version, only barely. It has some zeros across the bottom and some zeros and ones across this right-hand column. There's a reason for that. I'll try to talk about that next time. It ends up being mathematically useful when we get to relaxation. So we don't need it right now, but we're going to stick with this 4x4 four four form. All it's saying is that there's an RF operator that acts on the bulk magnetization to produce some, a new state of the bulk magnetization, this matrix operating on vector. In this case, we use this four element vector for the bulk magnetization. I'll, I'll explain why later. It's a convenient, it's a mathematically convenient thing to do when we get to relaxation. Um, and so this is just showing that same thing. All those sines and cosines, the theta, the phase, the RF amplitude, acting on the bulk magnetization, producing a new state of the bulk magnetization. And so that's coded up in the B1, uh, uh, this is the B1 operator. So we just saw, this is what I was just going through at the very end and in the previous slide, the change of basis and the flip angle rotation, and then you have to use this change of basis again. This uh, this series of matrix operations produces the B1 operator. This is what the B1 uh, field does to your bulk magnetization. So this will produce the B1 operator if you give it gamma, if you tell it how much B1 you have, some time scale that you care about, and theta. The time scales that you guys care about, uh, uh, for this problem, it's probably in the microseconds range or something like that. Sometimes these problems get a little tricky because you're not sure, you don't have an intuition for the problem yet. So think of delta times as being kind of in the microseconds range. Um, this is similar, just the B0 operator. We saw this in a slightly different form before. The B0 just causes a rotation about the z-axis. This is that 4 by 4 form again. You can almost ignore what's happening on those on the bottom row in that last column. They're mathematically convenient to show up later. I'll come back to it quickly. Uh, not quickly, but we'll get into that in the next lecture. And so there's a B0 operator here as well, which basically just says, if you tell me what your gamma is, you tell me what your B0 is, and you, care me, and you tell me how much time you care about, what's the time step that you care about, I'll tell you where the bulk magnetization ends up. Or I'll, I'll give you an operator that will tell you where the bulk magnetization ends up. So does this sort of concept of having an operator acting on the bulk magnetization to produce new magnetization, does that conceptually make sense? What, you base, what you're going to have to do, uh, and here's an example that's not your homework assignment, but pretty close to your homework assignment, or at least uh, conceptually close. You're going to have to do things like this in different places, right? You're going to set up a for loop, and you're going to take the state of the magnetization, and you're going to operate on it by some bulk, by some free precession operator, and that'll give you a new state of magnetization. In a for loop, you're just continuously acting on the bulk magnetization so that it goes through the steps of mutation, or the steps of precession, or in fact the steps of mutation and precession together. So you'll, you're certain to set up some kind of looping structure so that you can have all those individual time steps. Um, get on it, you know, take a look at it, make sure you understand this code. Uh, it's a good working example for the kind of thing that you need to do for that second problem. Um, in the last problem here, I'll talk about it and then I'll, then I'll set you free. Uh, this is a, a question about T1 relaxation and T2 relaxation. We haven't gotten to that yet, so you don't even know what those equations look like yet. That'll show up in the next lecture. Uh, this problem, it's not too bad. We're gonna, I'm going to give you some specific expressions. You're going to be taking the difference of those two expressions, and then you want to figure out when you get a maximum contrast, you have a function, how we have to differentiate that function to figure out when you have a maximum, uh, and that's going to give you a solution. And in this problem here, uh, it's, again, good to use MATLAB. You're going to make some plots from these relaxation functions that I'm giving you. You're going to prove that you can get the maximum contrast uh, with driving analytic expressions, uh, so here and, and here. Uh, and you're going to plot the solution to those analytic expressions and show that it agrees with what you can get just by taking the difference of two functions and plotting that in that way as well. So, uh, you know, on balance, I think problem one, uh, not too bad. Problem two, more time consuming. 
but it will get you going for a bunch of other stuff that happens in the class. Problem three is a little bit more math oriented and plotting some stuff in that lab. Uh, hopefully, um, not too bad. And then there is an extra credit problem. If you guys have better ideas for better problems, then you can propose one. And then, uh, if, it's a, if it's sort of set up well and, and designed well, then you can have an extra credit problem as well. So I'll put a few of those out there. Um, homework policy in general, you usually have about a week to do the assignments. Uh, I'm sensitive to midterm exams and other ongoing conflicts. So I'm reasonable, just talk to me. Um, and then the other thing I'll say is, it said at the very, very beginning, there's a late policy, bottom line, there's there's a penalty if you turn things in later and later. It's a decaying exponential because you do that a lot in this class. Uh, um, so it's not too unreasonable. So just turn it in when you can, but there, I think it's set up for uh, next Tuesday at 10 p.m. or something like that. So, uh, okay? Take a look at this before Thursday. Uh, so if you have questions, you're sort of on it, you can ask me questions or get some TAs and stuff. All right, thanks for hanging out. I'm going to have a little